So we'll uh, just give it a few minutes and, uh, you know, hi folks, thank you for joining early, but just let's just give it a couple more minutes and hi, Akla. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Shivakami and I see Kalpana and many others, Maya. Good afternoon, Professor Subara. Good afternoon, Sri Lata. So, Bharat, who is uh, hosting this? You and uh... Sai, uh, Sai yeah. Okay. No, should should I be co-host just in case there is an issue with power or something? Uh, so in that case, it will be. I mean, I think Venugopal sir will transfer it to me once he leaves. Okay. Uh, no, already you are a co-host. I'm a co-host. Okay. okay. All right. I feel I feel a weight that weight of responsibility now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's shared between. Three of us. So okay, then that's it's, it's fair. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Mangai. You're in. Okay. Hi, hi. 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 Okay, should we uh, begin? Uh, what do you think? It's three, two. We'll give it a few more minutes. Three, I think we can begin if it's okay with everybody. Yeah. Maybe we can wait until three five. Like give them three more minutes. Yeah, three more minutes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know because, a few more said they yes. will join them. And some connection issues are always there. Mm. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, I think uh, we'll begin and let people uh, join. There isn't a, a passcode or a barrier to entry, so I guess uh, people can join. So first of request, uh, if, I, if everyone could, you know, sort of mute themselves. And I mean, of course, unmute yourself when you need to ask a question towards the end, but uh, just in the interest of uh, the talk itself. Um, so uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, event. On behalf of the Center for Creative Writing and Translation, Sai University, and the Chennai Mathematical Institute's Arts Initiative, we are happy to welcome Thomas Hitoshi Trukshma, translator of Abayar and Tiruvalluvar. 
Welcome to all of you in the audience as well. Thank you so much for being here, for honoring our invitation. Thomas Hitoshi Sukshma is an author, translator, teacher, as well as performer. His translation of uh, the classical Tamil masterpiece on ethics, power, and love, the Kural, Tiruvalluvar Tirukural, was recently published by Beacon Press. Uh, he has many other books, which include For the Safety of Edges, a book of poems, a translation of Avaya titled Give, Eat, and Live, and Body and the Earth, uh, done in collaboration with the artist C.F. John. Thomas speaks and performs widely. He teaches for the Cozy Grammar series of online video courses, and he has received numerous grants and fellowships. He's currently visiting us at Sai University, and needless to say, we are delighted and honored. Uh, on his website, Thomas writes, uh, and I quote, in the Tamil-speaking world, rooted in the state of Tamil Nadu in South India, this book, The Kural, is revered as a guide for how to practice compassion, goodness, and good sense in the nitty-gritty of daily life. Uh, yet this masterpiece of world literature, which is on par with the Tao Te Ching and the poetry of Rumi, has long lacked translations that make its guidance, vision, and playfulness available to readers in English. And for years, I never dared or even thought to make a translation. And then, of course, it happened. And so we are here today to listen to Thomas tell us about the journey and other journeys that he undertook. Thomas's talk is titled An Apprenticeship to Aliveness, a title that immediately draws us in. Uh, the abstract was circulated to all of you, so I'm not going to go into it, except to say that this is um, kind of designed as an interactive talk. Uh, it will run for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so, and will be followed by a Q&A, uh, uh, you know, so you can either use the chat box or unmute yourselves, raise your hands to speak or ask questions following the talk. So um, over to you, uh, Thomas. Thank you so much. Thank you, Filata, and my thanks to Akila, to Sai University, to CMI, and to everyone who is here today. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here speaking with you, um, getting to uh, to share together. And I, what I probably will, what I what I have sort of envisioned, and this may change in the moment, uh, as as can happen. But I speak for maybe thirty to forty minutes, share a little bit of the story of how I came to translate Abayar and Tiruvalluvar, um, and give try to give some offer some insight into how I uh, approach translating these these seminal poets, these great and in some ways intimidating poets, intimidatingly great poets, uh, and just give you a little window into into my thinking and experience. Uh, my philosophy, to the extent that it could be called that, of translation, and then I'd I'd like us to, to have a, a you know a Q and A session, which I, which which my my aspiration would be, my hope would be that it would become a kind of dialogue, because the translation itself creates a kind of dialogue, a dialogue between languages, between poets in different languages, and then between um, you know people who can encounter these works in various. Uh, circumstances in very various contexts. So I'll start by giving a, a sort of brief, uh, I'll tell you the story uh, in, in, uh, of how this, these translations came to be. And the first thing to say is that I never intended to be a translator. Um, in fact, uh, when I uh, began studying Tamar, I was under strict, in, uh, strict orders not to translate. And I mean that in a very specific sense. So in 1998, I was given a, a fellowship, a two and a half year uh, fellowship to live in the city of Madurai to teach at American College. I was teaching in a very special program for students with physical disabilities. So I spoke, I taught spoken English, and then uh, I was to learn Tamar. And also I was given freedom to explore anything else that might interest me about life in, in Tamil Nadu. And for me, that what I wanted to explore was life in the village. I wanted to learn firsthand uh, what such uh, a life can be like and to see what it might be able to teach me about how we relate to the earth beneath our feet and how, how we relate to our human and more than human neighbors. And, uh, and so I, I wanted to learn how to, to speak, and I knew I would have to speak as well as I possibly could, and I was extraordinarily blessed very early on in my stay to meet a great teacher, uh, Dr. Kuve Ramakodi, K.V. Ramakodi, who was at the time at, uh, a professor of Tamar literature at Saurashtra College, or he was, he was recently retired, he was still um, 
teaching a few classes, uh, but I would study with him in his home. Um, so I would teach at the American College during the day. I'd go to his house in the evening or on the weekends and study with him. And I'm, as I'm, I'm hesitating because I'm suddenly having all of these the memories flooding back from that that time uh, and that experience. Um, one of the first things that I learned, or one of the first things that my teacher uh, told me was that he did not want me to translate in the sense that he didn't want me thinking in English, formulating a statement or a question in English, and then translating it into Tamar and then trying to speak it in Tamar. Because he said, then you'll be speaking English with Tamar words, <laughs> because you'll, be, you'll still be in a mindset of, of the English language, the way the English language is, the grammar of, of, of the language, the syntax of sentences and so on. And he really wanted uh, me to be able to learn to think in Tamar as best as possible. And this actually began with us, uh, you know, me really entering into the, the, the basics of just the simple alphabet, learning to write it. Every day I'd go to his house, I'd write the alphabet and I'd say the, the sounds out. And I'd actually already had some preparatory work before I'd come. And I thought I got all of that already. And he showed me I didn't get all of that already because I was still thinking the sounds with English letters. Like, okay, so maybe we have, we have ka, so we have to put a K, we put an A in that. And so I was still thinking that way. And he, from the very beginning, broke that connection and associated each of the Tamar letters to the feeling of those sounds in my body, in my mouth, with my tongue, with the breath, the way the sound comes out. Of course, there were certain letters that gave me a lot of trouble, and he would drill me and drill me and drill me till I got them or started to get them. Um, and then he said, you know, as we start to build vocabulary and you start to to speak with people, speak with what you already know. Don't think in English. I'd love to say X, Y, and Z. And then he said, use whatever little vocabulary you know to express yourself. And this is how I entered in into the language. And and this was a long process. And after about a year, I was able to move into a village and and that was a, a, an exciting adventure that I'm still finding ways to articulate. Um, but in this process, uh, I, I had no intention, not, not even a translation, because I was, that was to the side, but I had no intention either of entering into the world of written Tamar, of Tamar literature. Uh, in fact, I kind of renounced reading and writing because I wanted to enter a spoken world, an oral world, world in this village. And also because I'd begun, begun to think uh, although I didn't dare say it out loud, that reading and writing were, um, didn't make that much of a difference in the world when so many good and precious things seemed to be in peril. This was sort of my mindset. And then, because my teacher was the sort of teacher who could inspire, could kindle enthusiasm, he started to push me. And he said, you know, we should really study some we should, you should learn to read and write. And I told him, well, that's a great idea, except my, I'm sort of totally swamped trying to understand my neighbors in the village. And, and, and he said, well, you know, when you go back to your place, you are going to want to read the letters that we're going to write to you, won't you? And I said, yes, I, uh, of course, I, I'd like to do that. And then he continued and he said, and you will want to write replies to those letters, won't you? And I said, well, Yes, I would. I'd like to be able to do that too. And so we embarked on studying Tamar literature. We began by reading the, the, the state uh, lesson books, textbooks, starting right from the very beginning at um, LKG, UKG, all the way up to uh, 10th standard and plus two, reading all of uh, the, the prose in those books. Uh, my teacher would skip the, the poetry because he didn't particularly uh, like some of the selections, or he didn't think it was the right time for me to explore these these selections. And uh, that was actually just fine with me because poetry was something I didn't really um, resonate with. I didn't really get when I was in, in school because poetry was something that sort of seemed a bit more obscure, a little bit more um, indirect. And I was sort of hungry for simple, direct, clear answers to things. But then my teacher surprised me again by saying, you know, now I think we should study poetry. And he started me with Alvayar. And he started me with the poems from Mudrai, which 
I've translated or go on to translate years later as uh, the word that endures. I learned 25 of these um, short four line Benba verses. And in learning these poems, my teacher would, would teach, would sort of walk me through each of the poems and give me the gist of the poems. And then I would go on and, and learn them by heart. And because there was still enough different uh, distance between my understanding of the poems directly and my, or my, I should say my understanding of, of, of Tamar at the time and the, the language of these poems, I couldn't yet understand them directly. So when I was memorizing them, I was memorizing them as sound, as pure sound. And this proved to be an extraordinary opening in my life, an extraordinary key, because in saying these verses out loud, I finally began to listen. I began to listen to words, not simply as, as things that convey meaning, but as, as sound, as music, as rhythm. And I found that these poems sound good. I can still remember lines that lit up for me. Uh, one is, is, uh, goes like this, Even before I understood what the poem meant, I could feel the sort of rhythm of it. There's a energy to it in the rhythm itself. And then I started to notice, oh, notice how we have the po sound, po sound echoing each other. And then I noticed how we have also these P sounds and these B uh, M sounds, pulukumange posiumam. And then I would notice these ah sounds. And then, and I found that a simple line like that became inexhaustible, just in terms of music, the music of the words, uh, the, the rhythm of the sounds. So that when I did come to be able to read the poem directly, the poem was all the more meaningful to me because I had heard the, the music. I had heard the music first and come to relish and enjoy the music first. And this had the effect of returning me to, to English, to, to my, my native, my first language, two and a half years later, um, newly awake, newly alive to English. I heard my own language in a way I had never heard it before, except perhaps when I was a, a young child and I began to relish reading poems in English. I began to relish memorizing poems in English and I embarked on a journey of, began memorizing hundreds of poems in Tamar and in English. And then I went on to learn Spanish and I would, this became part of my central practice. And even more than that, I realized that uh, I'd had, um, I, I recognized that my, I had this long interest in words and in language, went right back to childhood and I had gotten sort of not, I, I want to say derailed or sidetracked, those aren't quite the right words, but I had sort of squelched my interest in language and words and writing, worrying about the state of the world, worrying about philosophical kinds of questions. And Tamar returned me to that love, the love of language, the love of words, the love of speech, well-spoken. And I began uh, what would prove to be a very long apprenticeship to language, to poetry, and to writing. And as in this process, I, I found myself wanting to deepen my understanding of Tamar. And I received in 2003 and 2004 a Fulbright grant from the U.S. government. And I came back and I, uh, I stayed with my Tamar teacher during the week, living in his house and we'd study every day. And then on the weekends, I'd return to the village where I had gone, uh, where I had lived the second sort of year and a half of my initial stay. Um, so because and and this sort of these two poles, this world of literature and this world of of spoken tamar, uh, because I was interested in how language and land connect, how people and place connect in both poetry and in speech, and so that was a, a year of great deepening. I I read um, great works from the Sangam period, such as Purananur, Kurantogai, uh, Tolkapiam, uh, and it was the the work from the um, that we spent the last three or four months on. And what's interesting to me, because 
you know, I'm the 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 quarrel is on my mind, having uh, you know the, the translation having come out this year, is that um, even before I had knew that I was going to be be able to read it, even before I had any idea I might even dare to translate it, I had known of the work, and I'd seen how this work in particular lives in everyday life. There was a time when I was first teaching at American College, one of my students insisted I come to his house for dinner and overwhelm me with a glorious feast. And I met his friends and neighbors who all came to see this American who could teach, who would speak two or three words of Tamar at the time. And before I left his house, his father gave me a gift of two books of poetry. One was a contemporary 20th century Tamar poet, and the other was a gift edition of the Tirukurul. Uh, and he told me uh, in excellent English, he said, this book contains everything you need to know. So you learn Tamar well, so you can read this book well. And at the time, I remember thinking, well, this is a great, this wasn't a very, you know, a very simple family. And I was overwhelmed by the gift. And I felt a kind of wistfulness, too, because I thought, you know, I'm, I don't know if I, I, I could hardly speak this language at the time. I don't know if I'll ever be able to read some great work like this. And I kept it on the shelf. But then I would notice, you know, I've noticed the, the verses in the bus, uh, uh, as going to and from my teacher's house or between uh, the, the city and the village where I came to live. And certain verses would, would seep into even my lessons of spoke, unspoken Tamar. Uh, for instance, uh, the way I learned, the way my, my teacher brought me into the language is that we, we went through the entire dictionary together. He would, he would open the dictionary, he'd go through, and he'd pull out all of the words that he thought were most essential to uh, most sort of a foundational vocabulary. And this process had the effect of giving me a very expansive view of the world through the lens of Tamar. We got to the word vardit, scar. And to illustrate that word, he quoted a quarrel. Teen al sutta pumnullarum, ara de nav and al sutta vardit. And he pointed out, uh, so and I've translated that that verse in the, the Kuru translation. Um, I'll share the translation. A wound left by fire heals within, not the scar left by words. And my teacher is very insistent that there's this difference between a wound which can go on to heal and the scar which remains after, after something has maybe healed from within, but there's that, the, the tissue, the skin tissue, the scar that remains. And he, uh, so as I learned the word bardu as part of my entry into spoken Tamar, I also saw how a word like that could connect me to the word of, the world of Tiruvallamur, the Tiruvallamur. With my as we read this, uh, the 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 quarrel together, my teacher made sure I read not just the original text, but I read uh, so all of the major commentaries, early commentaries from 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, um, and I even learned how to write in the verse form. I learned how to write in quarrel uh, ba. I asked my teacher to teach me so I could learn how how things work from the inside. I wrote uh, maybe two or three dozen very bad. <laughs> my teacher would you know, look at and, and try to, you know, help me make them better and better. And, and of course, none of them were very great poetry, but they taught me something about the form from the inside. So all of this is uh, part of the background to how I came to translation. Because even then, even after this year of studying the portal, I had no, I had no intention to translate. And then something else happened, which is that having, uh, you know, lived with Abayar, having lived with the Quran, having memorized some six or 700 verses as part of the process of, of uh, studying the Quran, I found I wanted to talk about these poems. I found I wanted to talk about them with people in English. And I realized that to do that, I had to translate them. Because if I just gave the gist of the poem, if I just gave the meaning of the poem, I felt like I was giving just the, the barest hint of what I experienced reading, listening, reciting the poem in Tamar. 
I would lose, if I gave a summary of the, the idea of the poem, I would lose that very thing that had drawn me to it in the first place, the rhythm, the music of the words, the play of the consonants, the play of the vowels. And so I found uh, myself embarking on a new part of my apprenticeship. In addition to, you know, I was, I had by this time, been spent a number of years writing every day and uh, memorizing many, many poems. But then I found, okay, maybe I can become enough of a poet to be able to translate some of these poems as poems. And I began with, with Albayard because I had begun, uh, she had sort of shown me the way. She had uh, introduced me, if you will. She had become a teacher of mine uh, to what does it mean to read a poem? What does it mean to write a poem? And so I began working on poems from, from Mudrai. And I found quickly that what that I, you know, I didn't go in with any theory. I didn't go in with any idea exactly how I want to translate these poems. I just looked at the poems. I read them and read them until I thought, you know, what is it, what seems most essential to try to carry over into English? And what I found was I wanted to carry something of that short four line form with its sort of musical structure. So I said, I want to have this form, which is basically, you know, these three full lines and a shorter fourth line. And I wanted to do something that captured the way that certain consonant sounds rhyme with each other and certain vowel sounds rhyme with each other in the middle of words. And uh, this was my way to try to emulate in English the Yedigai uh, Mone pattern of a of verse of, uh, of Enba. And uh, that I completed, uh, I chose uh, along with the word, uh, the poems from Mudrai. I chose a handful of poems from Nalwari, uh, The Right Road, one, one, one way we can translate the name of that book, and some of the poems that are freestanding poems uh, gathered up into anthologies later on. And that book came out. Uh, I, I can hold it up because here we are on Zoom. This is the uh, the cover is uh, an image by uh, my friend, the, the artist C.F. John, with whom I have also written um, a book that's published, and I've also written two two more books, which are uh, on their way to being published. Now, this book came out in two thousand nine. All of this time, the quarrel was still part of my life. I still would recite my favorite verses, uh, but I I had it, that didn't enter my mind as something to translate, even though. Ever since I studied it with my teacher in 2004 and 2000, sorry, 2003, 2004 at the Fulbright year, when I spoke with him on the phone or when I would go back to Mother I and see him in person, he would say things like, you know, you know, Tom, somebody really ought to do a proper literary, poetic translation of Tirukurar. And I'd say, yeah, I think that's a great idea because I'd seen some of the English translations and they were serviceable enough, but none of them, again, conveyed that same experience that I'd had reading the original text. And then my teacher would go on to say, and you know, this person who might translate this work, they should really read all of those old commentaries that you and I read that, that year together. And I'd say, yeah, that, that would be really the proper way to do it because they could bring that understanding uh, to their to the translation, I, maybe there's a good you know there's a PhD candidate somewhere who would take on such a project, and you know it really for twelve years, it really never occurred to me uh, that he was suggesting I might do it, because in every other area of life, I you know, having lived in his house and having known him for all these years, he never hesitated to tell me what I should and shouldn't do. He uh, was very forthright about that, whether I liked it or not. But he never once told me directly, oh, you should translate Tirukuror. And I think he, he, he never said that because he himself was a poet. And he understood a project like that, you can't just tell someone to do. You can hint, you can suggest and, and hope that it might occur to a person naturally, which is really the only way such a thing can occur. And so at the end of 2015, I suddenly had the thought, you know, I've been working at my apprenticeship to language and to poetry now 15 years, and, and maybe, maybe I could, as a part of my practice, my daily practice, maybe I could translate this work. And so on 1st of uh, January 2016, I thought, I'll, I'll start, 
I'll write, I'll, tra I'll translate one verse a day. They went like that. And when I had two or three chapters worth of verses, I explained to my teacher what I was doing. And, and he said, oh, good. <laughs> you finally, finally got the hint. And he said, you finish your translation, you finish a draft, you come back to Tamil Nadu, we'll look at it together. Um, and we'll make sure it's as good as possible. And so in 2017, I was able to go back and, and, and see my teacher one last time and, and go through the entire translation together. Um, it was a very poignant time, actually, uh, because at the time his, his wife, my amma, uh, had, uh, had passed away and, and he was living with his uh, sons and daughters in their, uh, with their families in Chennai and in Bangalore. And so he wasn't able to be in the house that he and amma had built together and, and that uh, had still had lots, most of his books. But because I was there, we were able to go back and sit in this house again and, and go through the entire translation. So how did I go about trying to translate uh, quarrel verses, the fiddle quarrel? Um, well, I was lucky because Albayar showed me the way. Translating Albayar, the four-line Venba verses, um, had given me some basic principles about the length of the lines. And so I decided even if I can't have exactly the same scheme of four feet and then two and a half feet seer for each of those lines, I could at least mimic that sense of the relative length. So I thought principle one, the first line will always be longer than the second line as one of the ways to suggest the rhythm of the poem. Another choice I made was to, uh, as with the, the Alvayar translations, to find a way to, um, suggest the pattern of rhyming consonant sounds at the beginnings and the middles of words and rhyming vowel sounds within words. And this, is, it's, this, this choice was interesting to me, not only because it was a way to try and um, mimic the pattern of Yadiga Mone in, in Tamar in the original, but also because it returned, it, it deepened my understanding of English. Because when people think about rhyme in English, they think about, the ends of lines rhyming with each other. So you have ba 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 ball, ba 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 wall, ba 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 gall, or whatever, right? It's sort of sort of caricature of end rhyme. But if you start to rhyme the beginning consonants of words, or the middle consonants of words, or the vowel sounds of words, you not only return to the Anglo-Saxon roots of English, where rhyme was much more similar to Tummer. Uh, than, uh, than sort of 18th century or 19th century English verse. You also enter the realm of some of the great 20th century North American, 20, 20th, 21st century North American poets, people like W.S. Merwin or Wendell Berry or Denise Levertov, who became also interested in the consonant sounds and the vowel sounds of words. So there was a strange and unexpected bridge between the in some places, neglected poetic um, uh, potentials, poetic uh, qualities of English, and the the poetic uh, form that Thirubhar dedicated himself to. And I also, I made two more, two more choices with this translation. One was that I, uh, I didn't want to use punctuation. And I wanted, I didn't want to use punctuation for two reasons. One was that Theravalua himself didn't use punctuation. There was no need for punctuation. Um, punctuation, of course, comes later from interacting with, with English. Uh, and this choice was interesting to me because one of my important teachers and friends and mentors, W.S. Merwin, found himself jettisoning punctuation somewhere between, I think it's his third and fourth books of poetry. What he found, and this matched my own experience, was that punctuation will pin a poem to the page. It, it sort of keeps it in the world of, of uh, the, 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 the written language as opposed to language as it's spoken out loud. And so he unpinned his poetry from the page by getting rid of punctuation, which involves the reader in a new way. The reader has to uh, begin to breathe with the poem, saying the poem out loud to see where do the where do the pauses want to go? How do the words coalesce into different forms of meaning? So I, th that's what I wanted to do with the the, the translation of the quotal as well to bring that sensibility, uh, that aliveness that comes from having to co-create, co-experience 
the experience of the poem. And then I made one more choice, which is that, you know, no matter what I would do, there, there are certain verses that need a little bit of guidance, a little bit of ex explanations. Maybe there's a word that, that doesn't really have a proper English equivalent and it makes more sense to leave it in, in Tamar. Or maybe there's, there's a word that has a, a set of connotations that I think a reader should be aware of. So I also wrote a commentary. I wrote a commentary of my own drawing on the commentaries I had read with my teacher, uh, drawing on Manikudavar, uh, drawing on Parimel Alagar, and uh, also drawing on my own experience as a poet, my experience of the Tamar and my experience of the English language to make a commentary of notes. If this the idea of a, a commentary of notes of a, a Kuripurai came to me from reading Silapati Garam. And I loved the commentary of notes from, from that work. So I wanted to do something similar here where I could give just enough of, of additional context or, or uh, an observation or an alternative translation to a phrase so that the interested reader could use that in entering the poetry more fully. And this also had the added benefit of suggesting to a reader something of the experience of reading Tiruvalluvar, reading the Tirukkural in Tamar. Because, of course, when we read Tirukkural uh, in, in, in Tamar, we often read it with a commentary. Maybe it's one of the old commentaries. Maybe it's a much more recent um, commentary. But that, too, is part of the experience of entering into the poem, entering into the verses. So that, had, that was an additional, um, uh, I think, benefit, if you will, of, 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 of using the commentary as a part of the process of translating, again, the experience of the, the, the work. In both these cases, with, with Aubayar and with uh, Tiravalluvar, my most important aim, the aim that governed all of the decisions I made and all of the drafts, the many, many drafts that I carried out, was that I wanted to convey these poems as poems. I wanted to convey an experience in English which maybe couldn't be exactly like the experience a reader, a listener may have in reading or, or listening to the poem in Tamar, but at least an experience that might be analogous to that, that captures something of the music and the rhythm and the playfulness of these poems. Um, so that is a kind of uh, a brief uh, introduction to how I, I tried to, to translate these, these two extraordinary poets, extraordinary, the work of these two, these two great poets. Um, you know, I have a, a couple other sort of thoughts and, and uh, observations that I, I, it occurred to me to say, to share. But before I do that, I'd actually like, since we're all gathered here, I was, I'm curious to know, I'd actually like to turn to some, some questions. I'm curious what, um, what of what I've said may have, have caught your attention, may have gotten you wondering about something. Um, and we can proceed from here in more of a dialogue or more of a conversation uh, to see where that may lead us. So I'm curious, are there, are there questions that, that people want to ask? Yeah, you guys can either uh, put your questions in the chat box. I'll read them out uh, to Thomas, or you could unmute yourselves and ask. I lost power for a brief while in between. But... Uh, Sri, uh, Kalpana here. May I begin? Yes, please. Yeah, yes, Kalpana. Um, I wanted to start by saying, Thomas, thank you so much. It was uh, mesmerizing to listen to you. And uh, it reminded me of the fact that as a school child, um, I, <laughs> I, I was forced, like all my classmates were, to memorize the Kural uh, every year. I mean, every year we would have, and then we would have Ahananuru and Puranuru, and all of this was part of recitation in the classroom. And like every other school child, I hated it at that point. But, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but even as a teenager, and as I got slightly older, maybe in class nine, class 10, I realized that I was falling in love with how, how beautiful it was uh, and, uh, and, and how much pride I was taking and how well I was doing it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was doing it so well that I was again forced this time by my Tamil teacher to learn the Divya Prabandham as well, ah. you know, that devotional verse. Yes. And to, ha to recite it in uh, certain um, literary events that were being organized at that point of time. Um, so while I did not choose any of these activities, and Tamil is my first language, I, I did fall in love with the music of the language. 
and but I'd forgotten <laughs> this because <laughs> what I do now in life for my bread and butter, as Sri Lata will tell you, is very very prosaic <laughs> and has to do with um, thinking about and you know worrying about the problems of the world, as you put it so well. And listening to you reminded me that I once loved these recitations, and um, I would love to go back to them again just for the sheer pleasure. Yes. Of uh, and just for the memory of that, just for the memory of that. And thank you. I mean, just listening to you brought it all back. And I must say, I enjoyed listening to you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I love I love what you said about the enjoyment. Be because for me, the way into poetry was pleasure, yeah. sensual, yeah. sonic exactly. Exactly. pleasure. Yeah. The 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 you know, reading them, and I was lucky, my, of course, my teacher suggested that I, I translate them, he didn't compel me, and I wasn't, you know, it was, it wasn't a degree or a grade hanging over my head, thank goodness, um, but then as I listened, you know, I became, you know, delighted by, by some of these poems, and, and the same thing that happened to me reading, you know, so first with, with Alvayar, but then with also with, with Tervaldubar, because I had this image in my head from, previous English translations and from even just the the covers of the books that I thought well this is kind of a serious book right mm -hmm. it's about good and uh, you know uh, right and wrong and uh, the proper way to do things and it yeah I, I, I was a little intimidated by that image of a kind of you know strict <laughs> uh, you know, almost like a taskmaster sort of thing but what I discovered reading Mm -hmm. experiencing with Tamar is that this is a poet who loves to play, mm -hmm. who loves to, mm -hmm. to, to, to play upon the meanings of words. I mean, one of the verses I learned very early, early on, even before studying the, the work formally, was uh, And I thought, this is fun. I mean, and he's talking about serious stuff, remembering good things. Somebody does something terrible to you, you know, you, you forget it that day itself. Very serious stuff. And yet he has so much fun reminding us of that. And yeah. that fun is essential. That delight is essential. Yeah. Um, and it's what transforms it from being a book of rules to being a book of poems and being itself a poem of poems, which then start to speak with each other and to resonate with each other. Mm -hmm. So I really, um, I honor you for, for bringing enjoyment, that, that <laughs> sense of enjoyment into the conversation. <laughs> Can I, I ask you something? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've always been fascinated by that poem of Aware, where he's talking about, where she's talking about how one's stomach is so uncompromising, uh, starting with Urunal uh, Unaveri, Uri and I would like to know how you translated that expression, Idumbai Kur Envaire. Let me find it. Give me a second here. Here's, here's my translation of that poem. If I say, give up food for one day, you won't. If I say, for two take, you won't take. Oh, belly, full of pains. You don't know one day of my grief. How great, how rare to live with you. <laughs> and I love that because it could be a very austere sort of poem, right? But there is this, again, this quality of playfulness. It's really art of tanmay in there that I, I, anyway, I take great, great delight in. It's lovely, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. You can relate to this experience. <laughs> There is a little, I think, a comment and a question from Anamika Shyam. So yes. Thank you, Thomas. The way the joy in the process has come across through the way your whole being speaks. Could you share any philosophical nudge from these works that changed your own life or provided an, an insight into the reality of the world you live in? Mm. Philosophical nugget. Philosophical nugget. That's a great question. And it's great for several reasons. One of them is that my academic background was actually in philosophy. I studied philosophy and particularly moral philosophy and ethics as an undergraduate before my adventure into the, the Tamar language, which of course here continues 24 years later. But my life journey, taking me through philosophy and then into poetry, then brings me to 
Tirukurok to Thiruvalluvar, who is as uh, who is simultaneously a poet and a philosopher, for whom poetry and philosophy are not two separate things, but are deeply intertwined. Um, and so, in some ways, that that is sort of a large um, a, a large shift, or I should say, not a shift, but a kind of um, affirmation to me, because in fact, my own journey had been searching for something like that, a what we could call, what I would call following the, the Canadian philosopher Jan Zwicky, a, a lyric philosophy, a philosophy which is uh, philosophy and poetic all at the same time, and which is strangely um, less common in sort of the Western world than I think it ought to be, because we have this you know 2,000 plus year fight between poetry and philosophy that Plato began. Uh, and so we have a very strange relationship between poetry and philosophy in, in, in the West to the point that you get philosophers whose work is almost entirely unreadable and, and poets who are who become so constricted in their exploration of the world that they don't, um, the, 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 the poems become very specialized um, um, uh, that, that, that don't sort of speak to the bigger questions of life. But if I were to think of some, I mean, there's, there's so many, right? There's so many sort of philosophical um, uh, bits. But let me, you know, here's one that that occurs to me uh, because it is one that that connects to. Uh, see if I can find it here. I want to connect this particular insight to the poem that embodies it for me. Thank you for your patience. And in fact, it's the, it's the poem that connects to Albayar as well. And it has to do with the relationship between ethics or goodness and the continuing existence of the world. Um, in fact, I'm going to read two poems because I want this is this is something I've learned from both Albayar and Tirabarlubar. Um, in in the chapter on compassion, Karnotam, which I've translated as in a more literal way, but I think also a more poetic way. I hope uh, eyes that are moved, um, Thirbar Luar says, and I'll read the, the English translation. I'll read the Tamar too for those who are, uh, uh, would like to hear that as well. This is how the poem goes. The astonishing beauty of eyes that are moved because it exists. This world exists. The astonishing beauty of eyes that are moved because it exists, this world exists. And to me, that is an astonishing verse because it answers my own philosophical dilemma at the beginning about worrying about the world, the problems of the world. And, and how does that connect to my own small seeming existence, my own inner life. And in here, we have the expression of a, an entire lineage of thought and feeling, which says, you know, it matters that we're good in our day-to-day -day interactions, because that connects directly to the world continuing to exist. I mean, we find it all the way back in Puranamura, undal ammai bulagam. Because people of goodness, men and women of goodness exist, this world exists. And it connects to um, the poem that I alluded to right at the beginning, Putlukamange uh, Postiyamwa, coming from the verse of Abbayar talking about, you know, I'll read, I'll read the translation of that too, because I know there are a couple of people interested in, in hearing some of the translations. I'll do the English and then the Tamar and then the English. Um, the water that runs from the well to the rice also waters the wayside grass. If on our old earth there walk one upright man, for his sake everyone receives rain. Tolu legil 
நல்லார் ஒருவார் குளிரே அவர் புரட்டெல்லாருக்கும் பெய்யும் மழை the water that runs from the well to the rice also waters the great wayside grass if on our old earth there walk one upright soul for her sake everyone receives rain and i love this sense that if a person takes the effort to cultivate their character to to strive to to walk the difficult road of being a good human being in a confusing and tumultuous world that that connects to the heavens above that connects to uh the continuing flourishing of of the, of our earthly home uh and so you know we find in in these these poems from third fourth fifth centuries from the 12th century in the case of alvayar an understanding which connects directly to the present and where we look at a world where we in ecological turmoil as well as political and social turmoil uh and in some ways it makes their work more relevant than ever so um that may have been a bit of a detour around but that's that's what occurs to me in uh describing something of my experience of how living with these poets living with these poems has um worked on me has uh helped to shape my own vision my own way of perceiving and experiencing and of aspiring to be in the world are there other questions or comments or yeah. wondering hi hi thomas and maya here um, i'm also a poet um i don't have a question but i just wanted to share a few thoughts so the first one is um what you were speak saying at the beginning of your talk about how you found the translations prosaic um i had the same experience and i'm so thank you for the translation that you've made because you brought poetry back into the translated version of the tirukkural and thank you for that the other thing that really struck me is when you talked about how you translated and you released the poem away from the punctuations and got the reader to read it in the way that the reader felt so it became an interactive reading process and i think that was very brilliant so uh, as somebody who practices poetry and stares at the page agonizing over the full stops and the commas and and the hyphens and the colons i i think next time i write the poems i'm going to just liberate it and not worry about the punctuations <laughs> that's an insight for me to in my own craft so thank you for that as well lovely uh, yeah it's been a pleasure listening to you well thank you thank you and you know i mean i could i could be devious and i could say that in, you know i i there are probably poets for whom punctuation is an extraordinary form of music right <laughs> that, that the yeah. punctuation becomes for you know for a, a for a merwin the path is to let it all go for another poet it might be to bring it all in and to use punctuation in ways nobody has ever seen or heard before so it's and i what i love this the adventurous spirit you know to, yeah. to dare to say well maybe i'll i'll just leave them out and see what happens because something yeah. might happen that that will be surprising and delightful yeah it's worth a try <laughs> yes uh, you, for you sure you don't know what you're going to find right so that's the yeah. whole creative process yes um, yes so i just wanted to share these thoughts well thank, thank you. you thank you are there any other questions or comments uh yes i saw a hand up uh, yeah uh, i have a question am i okay go ahead uh hello hi yes. uh, hi thomas uh, hi. thank you for the wonderful uh, wonderful exposition about how uh, this entire process has gone through for you um i had a i mean i am someone who's from mathematics who has very mm. a very um you know let's say fleeting knowledge of philosophy and literature is only in my past time when i delve into these things so uh, if you could explain to me by an example um if uh, let's say you've been doing this for uh, for quite a few years now like 2015 or 2016 you started the entire translation process so over this entire course of time has there been any uh, shift of interpretation of some verse you have selected say you uh, you uh you read it in some manner and you perceived it in some manner initially and say five years down the line you see that there is a drastic 
shift in how you perceive it now and how you would want uh, the readers of your text to perceive could you just uh, explain to this uh, explain this with an example if possible mm, because i have absolutely zero um, idea about the text i'm just trying to get into literature again ah, so well lovely um your 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 question and your comments bring up a whole bunch of things for me one of the things is i love that you know you coming from mathematics and you're interested in you know also in poetry and 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 literature and i think there there is an interesting similarity or um a common concern between not just poetry and mathematics but i would say also music which is a, a an, an, as i perceive it and you may have a different perception um but the interest in form the interest in how you know, the elegance of a great equation, for instance, is similar to or analogous to the elegance in the structure of a poem, and is similar to and analogous to, I would say, the, the, the structure, the harmonic structure of a great song or piece of music. Um, and yes, there are, there are certain, there are key uh, verses that, that I have pondered over, um, and, and, and my understanding of which has deepened uh, in the time that I've I've lived with them, um, in fact, there's 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 so many. It's a little bit difficult for me to um, to to choose one. But the, there's two that I want to share um, for two different reasons. One uh, has to do with uh, something that I was really excited about that had not wasn't just a particular verse, but in fact had to do with a whole series of verses, uh, and it has to do with the word. Uh, um, that, that I've translated at, at certain places as oricum, or con I, the, the word oricum, which I've translated in a number of places as conduct. And it's a word that means sort of good, good conduct, good uh, upright uh, behavior, among other things. But this word uh, has is rooted in um, the, the, the root oric has to do with uh, also the flowing of water. Uh, there's a kind of watery element to the world, to the word and to the world. Um, that I started to notice flowing through the book. So for example, the 20th verse, the, the 10th verse in the chapter on the glory of rain says, no being can, in my translation goes, no being can be without water. Nothing can flow for anyone without rain. And so here I wanted to use the word flow to convey how the idea of things flowing, the idea of conduct that flows uh, in harmony with the world, is also connected to rain, to this essential element of our existence. And that you can, in fact, look that every time the word uh, oricum, conduct, appears, if we connect that with the glory of rain, we connect that with what I was alluding to earlier about um, uh, how a person's, even just a single person's goodness might connect to the continuing flourishing of the world. You realize there's a profound ecological sensibility at work, which is simultaneously ecological and social and cultural and poetic. And that's the kind of lyric uh, intelligence that I honor in, in, in Alvayar and I honor in, in Thiruvallur. Uh, and for some reason, this may be a kind of tangent, but your your question made me think of one other verse, uh, and it's a, one of the first verses that I, I my teacher taught me, and this is well before I was studying the work um, formally. Uh, it was just it sort of came up because I think it exemplifies something that is unique about poetic expression and about uh, what happens when we listen to a poem and we listen to the silence in a poem and i'll read i'll read the english translation and then uh, the original and then i will make a comment and it's from from the third part of the book or the third book uh, on love and this is from the chapter on knowing signs the 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 young lovers are are noticing each other but not wanting to be noticed noticing each other and so it's in the voice of of the the young man who's in love with a young woman and he says when i look she looks at the ground. When I don't, she looks, smiling softly. And 
And my teacher read this verse, guiding me through some of the, the older language. And he says, do you see something funny? Do you hear something funny in this verse? And for a moment, I didn't quite get it. And he said, look at it. When I look, she looks at the ground. So far, so good. I'm looking at her. She's looking away because we don't, she doesn't want me to know she's noticing me. When I don't, when I'm not looking, when I don't, she looks smiling softly. And he said, if you're not looking at her, if you're the young man, if you're not looking at her, how do you know she looks at you? <laughs> and so the most exciting and interesting and alive part of the poem is in the silence that you get when you live with the poem. You're like, oh yes, he is looking, but as if he's not looking. And that there is this play that we have with each other, looking and not looking and seeming to look and not look. And that he gave to me as an example of a particular kind of poetic delight, which has just grown in me ever since. That was a little seed, if you will. And 20, 24 years later, that seed is still growing in me in, in the sense of how can a poem, the words of the poem evoke the world beyond the poem. So I hope that gives something of an answer to your delightful question. Thomas, I think yes, this thank question, you. Uh, from Vasanta Surya. Yeah? Yes. Vasanta, you're on mute. Do you like to ask your question? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I want to say, first of all, I, I enjoy it very much. It's something quite different from anything I've ever heard spoken about poetry before. And um, you see, I often thought, I, this feel, I feel the poetry says what cannot be said in any other way. Yes. It's just, that's the way it is. And I think that uh, um, it's, <laughs> it's wonderful that you have understood, uh, you know, there, there is, in that is an answer to all the philosophical questions of the world. That sort of thing. It's you. You've gone beyond that. It's just. It's. It's. And you're played with it. That is terrific. That is marvelous. And I'm very happy to hear what you have to say about the Quran. The Quran is a part of our background, and uh, and it has been uh, unfortunately for the, those of us who those of us who like me have been brought up in English, morally more more or less. We have lost the poetry of it, and we have mm. just been moralizing, yeah. and and. Uh, so it, has, it hasn't really clicked with us, and has not, until we ourselves began to look for it, and became interested in coming again. But by that time, we were not into philosophy. So now you have brought us together again. Ah. So it's not philosophy, it is old come, as you said. That is something uh, rather beautiful. And I love that, love that expression. That old come has given me, I, the way you've explained it, it's, uh, it now it's, it's really so much more natural to be like that. It is natural to be good. That's the yes, point. Yes. Yes. Beautifully. Uh, nothing to be, don't make a big deal of it. Artlessly be natural and good. That's what he's trying to say. And of course, many years ago, I did have the pleasure of uh, reviewing a book of P.S. Sundaram's on the Kamatapal. Ah. That, and uh, I remember enjoying it very much and thinking, oh, but this is much better than the rest of it. The rest of it <laughs> <laughs> I felt that way. Uh, and I see now, um, as I read, I'm, maybe I'm a little old, much older. So now I, I think this is a wonderful book. I'm dying to buy it. I must buy it immediately. I just mm -hmm. talked about you today. And I don't know what I was doing all these years, not knowing that you exist. It's very nice. Wonderful. Thank Glad you. to know that Tamil uh, has a person like you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I love, um, I, I love that, you know, my question at the beginning as a, as a student of poetry is like, why do we have to say things indirectly? Why do we, uh, why do we, uh, you know, poetic forms seem, they can seem obscure. They can seem, um, you know, almost like, like, why just say it, just say, say it. But I think you say exactly the, the right thing, which is that the poet says what they feel they have to say in the way they feel they have to say it, because that gets to the unsayable that points us in the direction of the unsayable, which we can nonetheless experience. We can nonetheless uh, know. And you know what you're saying about the naturalness of goodness, I think is extremely important. Uh, 
Um, and there's, it reminds me of, of how I translated one of the verses from chapter 99, Sandranmai, uh, uh, which I've translated as integrity. And, and just, the, I'll read the translation of the first verse. I know we're, we're sort of running close uh, to the end of the time, but I'm happy to stay on and, and answer other questions. But it has to do with the naturalness of goodness. And here's how I've translated the verse. For those upholding integrity, knowing what fits, everything good is natural. And to me, that is a liberating, a deeply, profoundly liberating insight, um, which reconnects us, reconnects the philosophical and poetic sensibility, reconnects the arts and the sciences, uh, reconnects our own personal dilemmas and conundrums and aspirations with the larger flourishing of the world. So I, I thank you for your comments. Um, um, Thomas, there are just, I think, a couple more questions in the chat box. Uh, one by Anuj Kumar. Uh, and his question is, what is the challenge which you found and tackled when you tried to learn languages other than your mother tongue? So that's one. And then there's a question from Abhishek. But uh, yeah. Okay. First, um, the challenge of learning languages other than, than my mother tongue, other than English, there is there is uh, there are several. One is a kind of mental challenge, which is to enter into a different way of ex well, not just mental, but but how to enter in a different way of experiencing the world, a different way of ordering the parts of a sentence. To be very sort of simple about it or basic, uh, but that basic simple thing also affects how we experience things, how we perceive things. Um, uh, and so there, there is uh, learning to enter into an unfamiliar framework, an unfamiliar way of, of being in the world, perceiving the world. And with that, there is, because I've been so uh, interested in uh, the embodiment of words in poetry and speaking, and uh, is, there's also the physical aspect of it, you know, learning to train the tongue and the lips and the teeth to make sounds that I may not have grown up making. Uh, and this was true when I, especially true when I learned uh, Tamar. It was also true when I learned Spanish, which even though being a, a European language has perhaps more similarities with English than, than perhaps with Tamar, but it, there are also elements, sounds that are unique to Spanish, which don't exist in, in English. Sometimes they're very similar. In fact, are maybe more similar <laughs> than uh, to Tamar in some cases than, than to English. And so there's also the, 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 the physical uh, somatic process of learning a language, which offers uh, great challenges because you have to train yourself to move muscles, to move your tongue in ways that you may not have moved them before. Uh, and this is interesting because it opens us up to a different awareness of the body. Uh, which, which can be, um, I think, quite liberating and quite exhilarating when we, we step into it. So there's a couple of the, the challenges that I that I I faced, and you know, in the case of of Tamar, I was extremely lucky, because I had uh, not only an extraordinary teacher in the form of uh, Dr. K. V. Ramakodi, uh, but also uh, the village that I lived in uh, to the south of the city of Madara, and I continue to have a, a very I've now been connected to this village for 22 years. I'll be going there next week, uh, seeing my 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 friends and neighbors, my my family, the people who've adopted me as one of their own, um, because being with them took me across a, 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 a divide, if you will. Because when I was living in Madurai, I could get by, you know, if I if there wasn't, I, if I happened to forget the Tamar word, despite my teachers. Uh, insistence, I would, I could throw in an English word and people probably understand, <laughs> not in the village. And then I had to go all the way into it. Um, and I had to learn the extraordinary um, sort of helplessness of really learning a language, the humility that you, you, you have to have to really, to, to see, you know, this is big thing, this extraordinary, especially a language like Tamar, um, and 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 to to go word by word, expression by expression, sound by sound, um, willing to be surprised, willing to keep going deeper, keep going forward. Um, that that uh, and that that continues to this day. 
Yeah. So, um, sorry, uh, Anuj, I think you can take your other question later, probably offline or something, uh, because there are a couple more questions in the chat and we need to perhaps wrap this up in a while. Uh, so Abhishek wants to know, um, just curious to know if you're aware of Inquirab's play uh, Away. So that's that's one question. And Shivakami has a question. Could you please name the village so that I can visualize the dialect? Uh, um... Uh, I have just recently heard of the play. I haven't read it myself, but now I'm I'm going to run out and find a copy and and, and read it. Uh, I'd be very interested to see that. Uh, and the village I lived in is uh, Valayapatti. And there's actually several uh, Valayapattis. When I say that name, a lot of people think of a different village, which is a bit larger and more prominent. This is a small a small village near the the airport of of Madurai, um, that I am very blessed to be connected to. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, perhaps uh, I think we are sort of uh, approaching closing time. So if there are no uh, questions. I mean, is there any one question from somebody who has not spoken so far who needs to ask a question or leave a comment? Someone who hasn't asked questions so far? Can I speak two lines? Uh, okay, very quickly, perhaps, because we need to, I think, wrap up on it. Yeah. I don't have, I don't have any question, ma'am. So first of all, thank you, Professor, for like attending for uh, giving this wonderful session. Secondly, like, uh, I would love to go through all this, all those tips which you gave just now on my question of learning new language, language, because during pandemic, I began, I began to learn Spanish and uh, Telugu itself, but I left in between because of certain problems, because I was not, uh, uh, like I tried a lot, but uh, to, as you said, like you have to master your tongue, uh, uh, which you didn't do apart from other tongues. So like, so that's what I would love to go through all the tips which you gave me. So thank you very much once again. Thank you. Um, uh, and... Any one last question from someone who hasn't asked questions before? Akila, yes. Tom, I'm putting you on the spot. I love it. Because you spoke about musicality. Could you sing something from your maybe from your training because you know it requires so much training could you sing something for us <laughs> to close out the wonderful talk sure i can um actually i'm having too many ideas coming to me at the same time so i have to negotiate with them <laughs> negotiate with the things occurring to me um this may seem totally unrelated, but let me see if I can make the connection. This is just a, a kind of um, a, a closing line, a, a sung line. Uh, and it has to do with how people connect. How, so in, in, in creating a translation or reading a work in translation, whether we're you know, reading, approaching the, the quarrel through an English translation, or we're reading Rumi or we're reading Dao De Jing, um, you know, creating these bridges between traditions. We're really creating, we're simultaneously creating bridges between traditions and bridges between different parts of our own selves. Uh, uh, and there's a poem by the great Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, which was set to music by a Jewish cantor. Uh, and it has to do with, with song, and it has to do with the inner riches of our lives. So I'll, I'll sing it as, as, I, as I experience it, which is as a kind of, of blessing. The song is called uh, A Million Nightingales. And I'll sing it through twice so you can, you, can, you can hear it that way. It's just a simple little, it's really a little round, but it can be heard just as a solo voice. I have a million nightingales on the branches of my heart. I have a million nightingales on the branches of my heart, singing freedom, 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 singing freedom, freedom, freedom. I have a million nightingales on the branches of my heart. I have a million nightingales on the branches of my heart, singing freedom, freedom, freedom. 
singing freedom, freedom, freedom. May all of the nightingales on the branches of each of your hearts and all of our hearts together sing and sing and sing. <laughs> I thought that was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. All good things. It's me a different idea of the meaning of, you know, mukti or mokram or whatever they call it. Yes. <laughs> Something Definitely. different. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, I don't quite know how to do this vote of thanks because, I mean, I guess there's a whole lot of things to be thankful to, for. Um, but your wonderfully engaging talk, uh, I think, uh, you know, is, Really, really grateful for that. Um, I found we all found your reflections on the roundabout serendipitous nature of uh, creative work, of work of translation, fascinating. And the whole slow cooking that's involved, it made so much sense. It's really like a lesson for, for us, for me, certainly in creative work and creative living. Um, thanks to the Chennai Mathematical Institute uh, for partnering with us on this and for hosting this jointly. Also, thanks to Bharat, uh, to Mr. Vendu Gopal for the support, Mr. Nelayapan from Sai University for working on the creatives. Thanks very much to Akila Ramnaran for connecting me with Thomas in the first place or, and for, you know, I think that was the reason why this happened in the first place. Uh, yeah, and thanks to all of you, this wonderful audience for uh, your amazing questions and for staying with us right through. And hope to see you at our future events very soon. I'll keep you in the loop. Thank you. Yeah, bye, bye, everybody. <laughs> this will be available as a recording. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Sri. Thank you, Thomas. Wonderful Thank afternoon. You. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Kalpana. See you soon. <laughs>